Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let me check something real quick. I'm not sure. Okay. So, uh, yeah, today, um, I mean, I'm still talking about uh, the assignment stuff today. Um, I, I was thinking about, uh, probably we'll, we'll cover some pandas stuff. That's the only thing we really haven't talked about. I have a few things I can um, uh, say that might be helpful. Uh, think about pandas, uh, you know, reminders. Uh, the first assignment is due. Um, I think I, I saw most everybody... Uh, looks like they've accepted the repository. Uh, maybe one or two people haven't yet accepted the assignment. So yeah, if you haven't, you know, let me know. I know I know some people are still trying to get things ironed out with environments and stuff like that. Um, probably won't say too much more about that today unless people want to ask some questions. So um, um, yeah, does anybody have any like want to start off with anything about the, like the maybe the first? couple of questions on the assignment or uh, anything in general. So um, I've had, you know, so do remember that uh, the way we are submitting this is through GitHub Classroom. Uh, GitHub Classroom was down a little bit. I don't know if anybody noticed. Uh, a lot of people had already accepted the assignment, but uh, it is working now. So um so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be checking these. Uh, I still have a due date, yeah, tomorrow. Um, you should endeavor, you should try and get your things that you're working by tomorrow. Um, this first assignment, I'll see, you know, I might still accept some stuff on Saturday or Sunday, but uh, don't don't uh, count on it. So, so try and get uh, what you can done um, by tomorrow. I, I don't... Uh, um, you can take the whole day. I, I might have set the time for 5 p.m., but um, you can, um, as long as you get it in sometime Friday, I probably won't be able to start till Saturday anyway on this assignment. So, yeah, I did set for 5 p.m., but uh, it, is go it, is, it is okay to keep working on it past 5 p.m. That won't be a, an issue. So, um, okay. So if no questions and hopefully, oh, and, and have just another uh, note, uh, since I still continue having problems with Zoom, I did get up the last one, although it got cut off a little bit. Um, so as a reminder, if, if you're interested in those, um, there's a link that I'll be putting for the actual class sessions that I do uh, in the additional resources, um, any ones that survive. So I, I still, I think I know what the problem is, but I don't think there's an actual fix yet. Zoom isn't very nice for, they don't consider Linux a very big um, priority for them. So uh, I, I might try and like actually stop uh, my Zoom and restart it uh, once or twice here uh, just to try. It's, it seems like it is a memory leak. I'm kind of convinced that's what I'm seeing. And, and it, uh, once, the me once it leaks too much memory, it just slows down and halts on me. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and maybe break it up into one or two logical parts here. And uh, so we'll take maybe a minute or two break while I stop things and restart them. Um, all right. So let me, uh, I'm, 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 let's go through the, the notebook on pandas first a little bit. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, do the usual to open up my assignment. Um, so let's uh, open the folder. Or I don't know if I showed this before, but you know, once you've created the container, you should be able to find it um, and run in here. Although I don't have good names for some of these things, so I think this is my. Let's check if this is my. Uh, no, that's not the right one. <laughs> Anyway, I'll just go ahead and reopen the folder. So one way you can always do these is uh, you, you shouldn't clone things multiple times when you're working with uh, Git and repositories like this. So if I already have my folder cloned uh, somewhere on my local drive, uh, you need to remember where you put the stuff. Uh, so I put it in my CSCI 574 subdirectory. Um, and we'll get to reopening container. And it'll start my Jupyter for me. So I'll open up Jupyter using the uh, Jupyter Lab that's running in my container here. Uh, 
I mentioned this before. I think it, I think it just appends to the end of this file, so you kind of have to search through here. I don't know if anybody's if there's a better way to to find your token uh, if you're using the setup that I have here. But um, uh, whatever the last one should be the current token for the running. Uh, The run Jupiter Lab server. So, I'd be happy if, if everybody has any questions about the first task or the other two. We talked a lot about those on Tuesday, but uh, I can go back to those. Uh, I'm gonna, but uh, I'm gonna jump into the pandas notebook. So this is the stuff that's in the class resources. I just copied it over here into my assignment, so I can don't have to switch between two different uh, run Jupiter Lab servers here. So. Um, Pandas is a good tool to use to learn. Uh, it provides the, the way I think of Pandas is it provides a data frame uh, object that I'll talk more about. If anybody, is anybody an R programmer here? Anybody familiar with using R? So, uh, from my understanding, I'm, I'm conversant in R. Uh, I mean, basically, the, the thing R is used for statistical calculations. The big data structure in R is a data frame. So the, uh, the, the, the way that a data frame is it, always a two-dimensional table. So the way I always think of a data frame, almost always like a two-dimensional table is the best way to think of it. So uh, you can think of it as a table, each row, like we talked about, and you can index these by numbers or other ways, uh, is a sample for an experiment um, or um, some measurement that you're doing. But unlike for... NumPy, the columns, all the data doesn't have to be of different types. So one of the big differences between a data frame in pandas and a NumPy array is these columns, you know, I have an integer column. Uh, we'll have some examples here. Uh, I got column strings. And I don't, don't know if it's important for this class, but um, basically each column is represented as a, uh, a pandas series. Um, so, so really a, a data frame is a collection of multiple series, but there's a relationship. So every one of these series has to have exactly the same number of samples. So I can refer to the, um, the, the user ID or um, index zero and the username. That was my first two columns of my data frame. But the, the big purpose for a data frame is it's really meant to hold uh, sample data of also the kind that we use in machine learning or using statistical analysis um, uh, of, of different types, but then we want to usually build a model. So often in a data frame or, or in a table like we do in this class, we have things that we're doing supervised learning. One of these columns uh, will usually be like the, the targets. So I want to build a model for supervised learning. So this might be we're doing uh, binary classification that we'll be talking about later in this, this class. Um, this might be a binary value, yes, no, or zero, or one, um, that, that we ultimately use uh, as the target to do supervised or people have training. Um, so let me ask you for a little bit, but yeah, it's a little bit about using the series. Series is just a one dimensional uh, kind of a column. Uh, but uh, I guess um, kind of like we did for the NumPy array, um, you know, there are built-in uh, member variables for series and data frames, so you can figure out. So a series, all the values of a series have to be of the same type. So every value in a column, if this series is part of a data frame, uh, for this one, they're all float uh, 24. So we created a series by passing in. It inferred to use floats because we kind of passed in a not a number, even though everything else was an integer. So it decided a float was the best representation for this first example of a series here. Um, this one has six values. Um, uh, one thing about, so uh, um, I implied it here, but uh, the series or the columns have names. So instead of like for, for Python, uh, for, for a, um, a NumPy array, we always have to use integer indexes for rows and columns. But for pandas, if you find yourself using a lot of integer indexes, you're probably doing it wrong, especially if you're 
point out a particular column of some feature that you want to do something with. So, so uh, columns or series have a name. And so we often use that uh, instead of using uh, some uh, integer index value uh, to, to get you know, the frequency or whatever particular feature that we're interested in. If you haven't looked at this notebook, um, we show some examples of that. And that's, this is kind of the stuff that you have to do for the fourth question uh, for the assignment that's due tomorrow. But it has some similar things, you know, um, data type as a NumPy array. So you have data type and size and uh, shape. Um, I, so like we show here, I mean, it is possible to index um, um, a series by the index, by, by the integer index. So you can get the, the value, uh, the first one at index zero, um, or you can also slice and stuff. So we can get the first uh, three values, zero, one, and two indexes. Another thing that, um, so by default, it actually uh, has a, a second column for a data frame or series, which is the index number. These don't necessarily have to be sequentially numbered. So if you don't specify an index, it will default to zero up to one minus the number of items in the series or the data frame. But you can... Uh, so that's a useful kind of advanced feature of, of data frames or series that sometimes it's useful to have a specific index, uh, like a unique ID or something, if you're thinking of databases that you might use for your index uh, for things here. Um, so uh, uh, you have to know a little bit about using not a numbers, uh, NANs, um, or other things. So we'll talk more about these kinds of issues uh, actually starting next week, but um, so rarely in a real uh, machine learning or data analysis project will you have all the data. There'll be stuff that's missing. So you have to somehow represent that and handle that. So one way to do that is, uh, so Pandas supports, uh, you can do this with NumPy as well. Um, um, uh, even though everything is supposed to be a floating point type, um, you can use special indicators of things that are missing using not a number um, is the main one, basically, here. Um, okay, but so we'll mostly be doing stuff with data frames. I, I guess it is good to know that, that behind the scenes, this is using a series. We rarely in this class will have to drop to an individual instance of a series to do stuff. Um, so, um, um, an easy way to create a data frame is to use a dictionary, uh, a Python dictionary type, right? So what happens with the dictionary, if you use that to initialize a data frame with it, is it's going to use the keys, uh, to create each of the series. Um, oh, yeah, I guess in this case, we actually, we explicitly have to pass in, uh, something that is a sequence-like I think. So you can pass in a series for each one of the, the, the columns that we're going to create for the data frame, but it will interpret other things. So like a NumPy array, as long as all of these are the same size, all these have to have the same number of values uh, in order to initialize a data frame like this. I guess that's not true. So yeah, it, uh, so, so I lie. Um, uh, if you pass in something that's like a single value, uh, it defaults to rep repeating that the number of times needed. So for A and, and G, uh, we're just going to get those particular values repeated for all of the, um, whatever the largest one of these uh, series were. Um, so, oh, and, and actually the timestamp was just a single one too. So our timestamp got repeated, but, but notice that these can all be very con. So the data type for each one of these um, um, is relatively uh, complex. So we got some series, some timestamps, um, some NumPy arrays, uh, and, and the value in these of so the actual data type for like column B will be a date time um, uh, type, right? We'll have integers and we'll have, um, um, Categorical variables and things. Um, okay. Anyway, oh, yeah. So here's the uh, uh, important. So what I was mentioning on that. So you notice that we got different types for all of the um, columns, and and we can use the D types for the data frame, like we did for the series. And we'll get what the data type is for each one of our features, each one of the column 
table here. So we got some floats and numerical stuff. Uh, we got categorical variables. Talk more about categorical variables. Um, so they're important statistics. If you have something that's a category that you're using a categorical variable, uh, a date time for one of these. Um, if it can't figure out what it is, it uses a generic object. So even for a string, um, 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 it defaults uh, to uh, an object type here. So whenever you get something like that, you might have to re-change the type or interpret it somehow. Um, so some of this will work, um, you know, so this should look familiar uh, from working with uh, NumPy arrays. So, you know, most of the time we'll be using, pretty much all the time we'll use data frames that are just two-dimensional, so, so tables. Um, you can get the shape, though. That will always be the number of rows and the number of columns, or in this class we'll think of that as the number of samples. It's the first item, and the number of features in the data set is the second item, the number of columns that we have. Um, and it used to be, so in previous versions of scikit-learn that we're going to use a lot, it really didn't know data frames. So data frames are a little bit more newer of a library uh, that, that was created um, um, after NumPy. So originally NumPy, everything had to be a NumPy array. Or sorry, it's, you, originally for scikit-learn, everything had to be uh, as a NumPy array. So you had to do a lot of stuff. If you wanted to use data frames, they're powerful for doing certain things. But then if I want to go and use scikit-learn, I'd have to convert the, everything into a NumPy array. So they make it easy now. You can convert just using values and you'll get an actual NumPy array. Uh, it'll do its best to... Uh, you know, everything has to be of the same data type, though, so you might get some surprising stuff. So since one of the things was an object, everything actually ends up being an, uh, one of these generic objects when we do this here. So we've, we've lost our information about the type, you know, that some of these are floats and some of these are uh, timestamps and things. They're really kind of string-like, um, character-like data at this point. Um uh, but anyway, to finish my thought, though, so more the in the last couple of years, Scikit-Learn knows data frames, so it, you can actually pass in pandas data frames in most places where you, you would could pass in like an array, a NumPy array to do um, different stuff with it. Um, okay, so then some stuff that uh, you'll need for the fourth question. So uh, I already mentioned that if, if you're using data frames, they're meant to be, you know, uh, you, think, you think of each one of these as a feature. So one of the most basic things you could do is get one particular feature from the data frame. So, so the name of the, the, the feature, the name of the column uh, is always going to be a member variable that you can access. So what we're doing here is this particular data frame that has two series of, of integer or float values uh, for the data type, uh, we can access the, the feature B or the feature A using the, the dot operator, right? You can access, I'll probably do it later on here, I mean, you can access by an, an index, but uh, for the most part, you really should be using the symbolic names when you're working with uh, um, features. Uh, for a data frame like this. Um, so yeah, in this case, what the, the B was, um, um, the oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Don't know if I meant that or if that's a mistake. So this is actually the, the B from the previous data frame. So yeah, this, this was the, uh, the the one that was the um, date time series here. Um, so we call this data frame two and this one, both of, both of these columns end up being, looks like a, a floating point type. Um, so yeah, if we look at this one, we see that uh, we ended up with a, a, a feature that's represented as floating point values here. So. Um, all right, okay, moving on then. Um, so most of the fourth question is going to be accessing stuff uh, in a data frame 
or manipulating or adding like a new feature, a new column on a data frame, that kind of stuff. So, so most of those, we give some examples, uh, if you've read this notebook, of doing that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, just look at, at this example here. You know, we're using different functions like to create a range of dates. Um, and um, uh, we create a set of random numbers here uh, of a particular shape. So, uh, oh, uh, yeah, um, did we use, anyway, let's, on the second example, we're only using this this array of random numbers of particular shape, 60 by 26. So we'll end up with, oh, oh we use the dates for the index. Yeah, so we're showing uh, an example of uh, of setting the um, a more complex index here, right? So instead of a, the default integer index, you would have, if you want to index into this data frame, you'd have to select it by a particular date or a particular date range to get uh, some sample out of here. Um, and likewise, instead of a particular shape, um, we have 26 columns, 26 features. We set the uh, the names just uh, uh, using this here. But you can you can pass in um, if you need to reset the the names of your features. You can always pass in a list like this, or even after the fact, you can change the name. So I think that's one of the tasks you have to do for the the uh, the, the fourth question is rename a column, create like a column, or rename it, things like that. So, um, so um, you guys get a sample of values, like the, the first five or last three or last five, or however many you want. Um, and we showed this before. You can pull out particular features by the name, the column name. Um, okay, and this is, I want to get down to here. Okay, so the, there's more about selecting the data here. Um, um, so there, there's lots of different ways you can pull out a set of samples or a set of features um, and do stuff with them in uh, Pandas data frame. You can use indexing. So the default, um, um, if you ask something like that, it's going to assume that you mean by rows. It's going to slice out. So that we end up getting the first three rows by doing what looks like a normal slice here. So row zero, one, and two, which have those particular indexes here, the uh, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd for the dates here. Um, sometimes uh, you, uh, sometimes it's, it's not possible to use this kind of shorthand to get a particular column like this. So like if you have spaces or something like that, which um, a side note, uh, it's not a good idea to use spaces for like feature names for columns like this. Uh, that'll cause you problems. So you should use underscores or maybe camel case note, um, uh, naming conventions, things like that. Uh, but for other reasons as well, you might not be able to, to get the name uh, in a simple way like that. So you can also... Um, and no, it is inferring something here. So if you give something like an integer or a range of integers, it's assuming that you want uh, samples, you want rows of the data frame. If you give something that's more like a, a string, um, in this case, uh, it will default to trying to pull out a column, uh, try to find a column with that particular name, C in this case, and pull it out. Okay, um, okay so getting into more uh, useful, interesting stuff. So, um, like we did uh, index based addressing, it's very useful to do a similar kind of thing. Uh, uh, give a list of column names uh, to pull out only particular features. So, here we're only pulling out three uh, features the DQ and P um, out of the data frame. By pa we're passing in just a regular Python list here to do that. Right? Um, so, you know, 
some things that seem like they should be able to be done, uh, you'll find that they um, uh, don't work the way you expect. So like if I wanted the first three columns, all, all the rows, but just the first three columns, uh, it doesn't allow you to do that for a data frame like you could with a, a, um, a, a NumPy array. So you get an invalid uh, index error. Uh, but again, you know, I encourage you, you know, uh, to, to think twice before you start index doing a lot of indexing by column number, but you can do it. You just have to use uh, the I location. So the integer location, I think, is what that means. Uh, that allows indexing kind of the same way as a NumPy array. So treating the first dimension um, as an integer index in the second dimension. Um, if all else fails, you could always fall back to this and get some particular numbered columns and some particular numbered rows that you need uh, to pull out. Okay. Um, by the way, so I don't know if I mentioned on this uh, in the notebook, but the result of doing that um, is, again, I believe it's a view into the data frame, kind of like you get a view into the NumPy array, so for performance reasons. So if you do something like this, um, you're getting another data frame, but it's really a view into the original data frame. Let's see if um, do I still have, no. Let me rerun everything above that so I get back to this uh, data frame that we're working on at this point. So, um, if you do something like that, like we showed before, Um, you're actually getting another data frame. Another view into your uh, data frame here. So um, later on, I mean, you know, if you wanted to, you can change stuff. So this is maybe given away one of the questions, but like, um, so like if we want to say add 10 to this first column here, skipping ahead to some of the other examples, um, I'll just add 10 to it. Hopefully that's right. <laughs> I'm trying to remember doing my pandas seek um, syntax correctly here. Um, hmm. Yeah, I thought that was allowed. Um, anyway, so, so you do things like that to, you know, uh, uh, here I was trying to modify the column. Maybe I'll uh, make a new column. That should be allowed. No? <laughs> so, so yeah, I think my problem here is that I really am working on something that's a, um, that's really a view into the original one, which is lost complaint. I've got to go back and remember this. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, been a little while since I've been doing, doing this kind of stuff with pandas. So, um, so yeah, I was trying to show that that, that would actually modify the original one, but uh, uh, we could probably, like we did before, make a copy here, um, and then that would be fine with all this stuff. All right. So, um, yeah, I think the reason why that wasn't working before because I uh, it's, it's trying to save me from myself of. Uh, I, I really didn't have uh, a different data frame. So these things would be modifying the one that's a view into. So, so here, since I, since I copied it, um, it uh, was fine now doing that. So, um,
So if we look at our A now, I um, should have added 10 to all those. So they're all a lot bigger, 10 something, right? Um, but yeah, there's a way to change these in place. Uh, hopefully there's an example of that kind of stuff. Um, so I know on your fourth question, you have to add like a zip code column and modify the type and change the name of it. Some other stuff like that. Um, all right, Let's continue on with these examples. So you can use that I look, look to um, uh, do the same kind of slicing by uh, index numbers um, that we saw before. So um, yeah, what's being shown here, you can access stuff by the that that more complex index number, but you do have to use the loc. So if we pass in the the thirtieth date that we had as an index, this is really pulling out the series of that one particular sample for that uh, for that date that we just looked at here. So um, oh, right there it is. So so yeah, this this was the the values for the date seven thirty one. Uh, that we had indexed in the data frame um, here. Um, but yeah, you can really uh, uh, use this kind of stuff to um, um, uh, do some powerful uh, manipulations of your data frame. So here, if we need a range, but but by particular date, so we need all the samples that occurred from the uh, July 6th through July um, uh, 16th. That's kind of what we're doing uh, here. And, and you can actually pass in uh, symbolic names if it knows how to convert that to the date time type. So we're doing the same slice here, but passing in strings that it interprets as the the same as the index um, and, and gets out kind of those particular things. Um, all right. So you can use location to get a particular column, although it's better to use uh, the, the previous things that we showed. So uh, just use the, the name of the column or the dot name of the column. But... Um, 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 and you can pull out like a range of columns, um, doing different things. Um, yeah, oh, and, and uh, right. So we um, have uh, some things on the fourth one where you're supposed to uh, add a new column and um, uh, rename and do some things like that. So you have to do some uh, similar stuff as it's shown in here. So here we're uh, actually um, um, taking out uh, particular columns uh, so that we can move them back to the front. So um, all this does is rename the, uh, the, 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 the names of, the, of, of our columns here. So we create a new list um, um, and so I don't know if it's obvious what's happening here. So originally we had them from A through Z. So by doing this indexing here, uh, a new data frame is created, uh, but um, um, with that particular order. So here we're using, uh, passing in a list to get out uh, the particular item. We're still getting all the columns, uh, but um, we um, get them in, so whatever order you pass in the values here, you'll get them out uh, when you do this. All right, um, so let's continue on with these examples here. Uh, are we Boolean indexing? Um, oh, so we spent a little bit of time on Boolean indexing for NumPy arrays. Um, so you, you can do some similar things. Uh, for um, uh, uh, pandas data frames here. So, um, which 
you know, uh, will, will also be useful when you do a lot of things like this. So if we want to get only particular values out of the data frame where the M column is in a particular range, from one to negative one, um, uh, we can do things like that, right? So uh, if it's easier, we can first kind of create our mass. So uh, I, I find it useful to break things like this down step by step, right? understand them. So all we're doing, for example, first of all, if I still have my same data frame here, um, uh, you know, we're returning a Boolean result. So basically this is uh, false every place where uh, the value is uh, uh, less than or equal to one and, and true every place where it's greater than one uh, when we did this on the column M here, right? Um, and we can combine those. So if we want all the places where it's greater than uh, one or you know, where it's not between one and negative one, where it's either bigger than one or less than one. Um, notice this is a little bit tricky here, uh, but uh, we are actually using um, a bitwise operator here. That's, that is the correct one uh, if you're doing uh, in, in this context here, um, uh, where, where I'm basically trying to combine two Boolean series, in this case, into a, a new one. So, so it should just give me the and of those. Um, so it, it, basically only, only the places where it's not in that range, which is bigger than one or less than negative one, should be, end up being true um, on this result here. So there's a couple uh, currently that match that. Not too many, but just a few. Um, so, you know, we could save that result in. So if we do this now, no, notice it, um, it, it's still pulling the whole, you know, so we got... A, B, C through Z and M and X, right? But so, so all this means here, when we do it like this, is I want those samples where the Boolean index is true. So, so I, get, I still have all of my features, not just the, the, the M that, that we made this mask on, but this should be all that we end up with one, two, three, four. We end up with five samples uh, where M was either bigger than one or less than negative one. I guess only, we only had things where it was uh, bigger than one here um, for some reason. Oh, big, yeah. Right. Okay. So um, those should correspond to the, the places. So we should end up with one, two, three, four, uh, five places where we had true on the mass that we did. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, again, th this, this is uh, very useful kind of stuff, being able to do things like this. So if, if you're doing analysis of some data set, some statistical analysis, you often need to slice it. And I only want to do an analysis on these particular partic participants that had this range of results for this task, things like that. So, so you can do um, uh, uh, pull out whatever you need um, and, and work with only those things. Um, so uh, we will later talk more about categorical data here. So we're going we're given an example of using. Uh, categorical data. Um, um, well, yeah, I, I, I guess the, 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 the best, uh, the, uh, one use of this example is we were adding in another category. Um, so, or another uh, column. So if, if uh, if you want to add in a new uh, column, as long as you have exactly the same number as the number of rows, you know, same number of samples uh, in our category here, um, we can take, so again, this, I guess, you know, this is kind of necessary if I want to 
do things like add and actually add and remove columns and stuff. All right, so we actually have a, a copy of the data frame two uh, of the data frame that we have here. Um, and this is a, a pending in a new um, column here called cat. Um, right. See where are we? Yeah, so I don't know if we've had all kind of the examples that you'll need to do stuff on this assignment. Um, So some more examples of using mask at this point. Okay, yes, let's, let's go on to loading data then. So um, one thing that I do like to mention, uh, you know, just be aware of this. Uh, so you really, uh, if you're not using the development environment that we have set up, Make certain that you are always submitting stuff with paths like this. So we assume this is standard practice, considered kind of best practice, is um, when you create a project like this, uh, there's there's some notion of the root of the project, which will have subfolders, subdirectories usually. So like in this assignment one, we have a bunch of them. So um, the notebooks are in the notebooks subdirectory. Uh, we do have a data file that you need for the fourth part for the, the assignment. Um, um, oh, um, we should have uh, the parasite data in there. I have to check. I don't know if anybody's done number four yet. I don't seem to see it in my um, uh, in my assignment one here. Uh, clone of the repository that I had. So if that's missing, I'll fix that. Uh, Let me check that real quickly here. So in our notebooks, if you go down to the assignment one, the fourth question, I haven't opened that up yet. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I, I just changed the name. So it is expecting um, uh, for your fourth problem, it's going to be working with this data that it loads from that file. So. But uh, yeah, back to the point I was making. So, so this is pretty common. Uh, so since this is in a project, it expects from where this notebook lives that you go up one directory and then go into the data subdirectory to find a particular file. So if you're doing stuff by hand, make certain that the relative paths are working correctly. You don't hard code in a path or do something else um, so that I can uh, get these running in like a, a an auto grader to at least see that everything runs correctly in your notebooks and stuff. Uh, for, for the um, uh, for the assignments when you submit them. Um, so for this pandas that I was trying to do here to make this work, since I copied these over, I guess I renamed the file. So so I would want to use assignment one dash data dash zero one dash data. Not CSV. Um, another thing I mentioned here, so so we are, this is actually a CSV, a comma separated value file. So you may or may not have seen those before, but that's mostly what we'll use uh, in this class uh, for data files. So if, if you actually look at the raw uh, file format for this, I'll open it up in an editor like, like Emacs. Um, um, it's actually a bunch of rows uh, separated by commas. That's what the comma separated CSV comma separated values mean. So, you know, if you're doing real uh, a real data analysis project, you're going to have a, a real big set of data. So you'd probably be like pulling the stuff from a database or something like that. But this is a common, uh, easy uh, format, uh, and and you can use relatively big stuff. So you know, having CSV value, value files of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, of samples in them is not unreasonable um, to work with. Um, but that, that's what we're pulling up here. Um, and, uh, and so for this first assignment, if you look at that, or we can look at it back in 
Uh, I, I, I double clicked on it. So Jupyter Lab has a can has viewers for other types of files rather than than just Python notebooks. So it knows that um, uh, it can kind of parse in a CSV. You don't see the raw, but it actually uh, separate those up into columns. Um, so we had what fifteen samples in this here. Um, by convention in a file like this, uh, often the first one is going to be the, the feature names. Right? So by default, when you read this into pandas, it will assume the first row is what you want to name each of the features for each of the columns. So uh, account, name, street, city, state, postal code, uh, January, February, March in this case. Right? Um, so in this one, some of the data is missing, but Pandas does handle that correctly. So I don't remember, let me see. Um, um, I don't remember if you, oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, this was a different data file that I had on the example here. So I, I was showing you the one for the assignment, which is using the postal codes and stuff like that. So, um, Actually, let me get the parasite data. So I'm not doing the stuff that you guys are doing. So, um, so in our class resources, uh, I should have had that in there for this notebook to be working. So if we look in the uh, class res resources directory, we should have that. Uh, yeah, it is in there. I just move that over to my um, assignment uh, data directory so I can use it in my running, you know, um, Project. So again, I'm running these notebooks. The, the root of this notebook is actually um, this directory here. The um, um, I'm sorry, it's actually this directory here. I probably pasted that the wrong place. So my assignment one, Derek Carter, uh, clone of my repository. There we go. So now I have it. So um, if I didn't have that in there, um, we would expect this to fail if we can't find it. You have to be aware of your file system uh, and where things are. Right? But wouldn't, wouldn't be able to find the, the, the file if we had that in there. Um, didn't I? Oops, I'm in the wrong place here. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, if you can't find and not, not a real helpful use, usage message or error message, but, um, but yeah. Uh, so as long as that file is there, one directory up relatively, it should be able to open it and put that back into my um, assignment one repository. Let me see if it's there. So, um, so yeah, if we look in our data, uh, parasite underscore data. So, yeah, if you see me making a typo or mistake, so the actual name is what? Parasite data. There we go. So in this file, um, if we look at it, so there's only three columns or three features. So again, there's there's one column that um, um, has the feature names, so virulence, replicate, and Shannon diversity here. Um, and I don't remember, so there's some values of zero. I don't remember if there's any missing values in this one. So now there's a few, yeah. So that, that's kind of the default. I mean, you won't, if you get a CSV, like um, I'll remind you guys that I am probably going to have an open ended uh, project. Uh, I'll post more about that more when we get. Kind of at the midpoint of the class, but basically what I usually ask people to do is find a, uh, a data set uh, and build a model with it. Uh, and there's lots of free repositories, not only Keras, but uh, um, the UC Davis and some others. I'll, I'll put a list of things to recommend to find. They're usually in the form of CSV files or maybe some other simple format that you can download. And so, um, but, but yeah, they don't always load in cleanly like this, right? So sometimes you have to specify extra stuff uh, to say I'm using commas or I'm using space. 
to ignore or keep the first line. You know, if, if there's a first line that that uh, specifies the column names, may or may not be there. Other stuff like that. So, um, but uh, yeah, for this uh, question four for this first assignment, I don't think you have to do anything but just load in the file, read in the the, the CSV file. Um, So in this example, we have what, 350 samples um, of three different features. Those three different features got read in. Um, and I kind of asked you to do this on the first one for the question four. So yeah, if you want to look. Uh, so head is usually, you know, if I, I need to get a feel for kind of just what the data is, I might want to sample randomly. Uh, we're just getting the first five uh, samples here, but then, um, um, so I can see that I got some value 0 0.5, kind of a question of whether is it all 0 0.5? What does virulence mean? Is there other values in there? Um, replicate. So um, this probably is um, like an experiment number. So we were probably replicating some set of conditions some number of times. Um, so we can see it goes up to one to uh, 50. So we probably re-ran the experiment 50 times with the same conditions, uh, I guess with the virulence of 0.5. And then we then we re-ran it 50 times with 0.6 and so on. Looks like what's happening on this uh, data set here. But, um, you know, I'm just going, this is the kind of stuff if I do with like an unfamiliar data set, um, uh, the, the first thing you'll do is you want to do a little bit of data exploration. So you want to probably open up the raw file um, and uh, see what's in there. Uh, and then you'll want to load it into a data frame uh, and then begin trying to figure out, ask, ask some questions. You know, So if you don't have what's known as a data dictionary, a description of what all these fields are and what the data is, you might have to infer things or do some exploration to find out what you have. So uh, we talk a little bit about that kind of stuff starting next week. Um, so these are some other things I think I ask you to use. Uh, I haven't shown these before, but there's some nice summaries. So again, at the data exploration phase, you know, you might want to ask uh, here. We're basically anything that's a, that got loaded in as a numeric type. Um, so I didn't show those, but uh, we ended up with uh, the first one, uh, for some reason, was an object, which is surprising. Uh, if, if, you know, to me, you should have been surprised by that because it looked like it, looked like it should have been numeric. But uh, now I remember there's some missing stuff. So it, it, uh, it, uh, instead of doing an NAN, it, it uh, defaulted back to an object type for this first feature here. Um, but anyway, that's what we got with the load. Um, uh, but we did get an integer uh, and a float for the other two types. So one of the first questions you usually ask about numeric data is what is the range of the data? Um, so what does it mean? What's its variance? What's the standard deviation? So describe anything that's a numeric type. It'll calculate all that stuff for you. So that gives you kind of a good summary, at least of the numeric data that you have in a data frame when you're doing your initial exploration, right? So this is showing me that I had 350 samples for both of these. Uh, these are the means, the variance or the standard deviation, uh, the min and the max, and then the range. So you get quartiles or percentiles. Um, so 25% of the values were between 1 and 13 on the replicate. Then that's not very useful for this one because we know from looking at that replicate went from 1 to 50. So that was really just the uh, 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 experiment number for the same condition that we were doing. Uh, but here it might be more useful for this. So Shannon diversity was was ranging from 0.8 to 2.9. 25% of the values in the, the Shannon diversity were zero or lower. So a lot of them had a zero. 25% 20, or over them had a Shannon diversity of zero. Looking at that. So only when we got to 50%, so 50% of them had 0.84 or smaller. Shan diversity. And that should be, uh, the, this is the median. So the 50, 50th percentile is, would be the same as the mean. So it might not be the same as the, the mean that you got. Mean and median are different. Um, 
and that reminds me, um, starting some thinking, begin to think about next week. Um, uh, we'll be getting into machine learning uh, proper kind of next week, um, but um, there are some um, um, there are some recommended. Actually, maybe not until week four do I have some of those. I do have some stuff that you might want to use to review. Like, so if, if I'm going past you on things like mean and median and some basic things from statistics, uh, we do have um, some lecture notebooks now um, in the class resources uh, and also some links to some other stuff for like reviewing calculus, uh, reviewing linear algebra, reviewing probability and statistics. So that stuff, uh, you might need to do a Git poll uh, I just added that stuff like uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, but um, um, so in your um, class resources directory, um, in the uh, lectures, uh, you might not have it until you could do a Git poll. Uh, but I'm starting to add more and more stuff. So I've got the, the notebooks for the Ing, Dr. Ng's uh, lectures are in there now. Um, and I recommend that you use those. Actually, I recommended those this week, uh, his basic uh, lecture videos on introduction to machine learning. Uh, and also uh, some of the stuff that I created um, uh, might be useful, like probability statistics right now, if you want a little bit of a review of, of uh, distributions and um, means of standard deviation and stuff like that. Um, Okay, so back to this here. So um, can't remember if I actually do something like this, but um, you know, one thing for data exploration is um, um, we might want to figure out, like, if we have categorical data. So one thing you can use is something like this, value counts. So again, this isn't uh, really helpful because I've kind of told you what it was, but um, on the um, uh, on the replicate um, um, feature here, that's really just the experiment number where we're replicating 50 times for a particular virulence. That's what I'm assuming here, just kind of looking at the data. Uh, so if you look at that, every, every one is seven because uh, we ran, we, we have 350 total uh, samples because we ran the experiment at seven different virulence levels, repeated it 50 times. So sometimes 50 is 350. But sometimes for, for uh, uh, I don't think I asked you to do this on this current assignment, but you'll need to do things like this on, on future assignments, is you need to know a particular column might not be numeric, it might be categorical. So I can use that to figure out what are the unique values and how many of each of those values happen on a particular feature, a particular column. So, so this value counts is a, a very useful uh, function that you can call. So notice what we're doing is it's, we're actually, this is a function of a series, right? So by doing replicate, we're pulling out the series for the, for the uh, replicate uh, feature for that column. And then we're calling the value counts on it here. Um, and, and again, so again, kind of showing some of the stuff we're talking about. We've only got uh, seven different variance levels. So those end up with a count of 50 if we count those up. Repeated variance part five, 50 times, and so on. Um, um, And you did have to do some, some stuff on this question four with missing values. Um, um, so here uh, we looked for stuff where that column had a space. So we end up pulling out, um, 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 oh yeah, so I remember now. So notice it was, it was uh, indexes 300 through 349 here. So most likely what happened on this data set, just inferring stuff here from data exploration, uh, somebody forgot to enter in. So, so the, the next virulence, maybe it was like 1.1 or something like that. Because right? we see that, that we 
the experiment of 0.5678 nine and one. So this this was all replications of some virulence level. I'm not certain what it was, but it looks like that data is missing there um, from this data set. So um, Um, so here is one example of doing something to clean, begin cleaning the data a little bit. So it looked like uh, we actually had like a blank or space for some of those. So by uh, by doing this, we actually said anything you see that's like just a single blank space, turn that into an NA value, not, not a number value, right? Um, so we end up with something different here if you were looking closely. Um, so instead of being uh, an object, We've actually now interpret this as a floating point number for the virulence. But notice when we look at the describe again, um, um, and we had 350 for the other two. They didn't have any missing values, but we only had 300 for that one because it was missing um, that all the last 50 for that last replication um, in there. Um, so. Uh, one of the first things you're doing with cleaning is, you know, you have to figure out uh, whether you've got missing data or not, and then you have to do something about it. So an easy thing is you could just drop all the, the missing data, uh, which is what the drop NA would do. So we would end up dropping all those ones at, at the end where we didn't have anything. Um, or we could fill in, so anything that's missing, we could just explicitly say that, that was meant to be 1.1 in this case. So now one of the things you did have to do was find out how many missing values were uh, in different places in the data set you do for the assignment. So there's various ways to do that. You can do it for a particular feature or over the whole data frame. So now after we filled them in, there's nothing missing anymore. So if we look for the is in a um, for the, um, um, the whole Paris, so we're doing this over the whole data frame. Um, uh, we don't find any missing ones. This point. Um, all right. You did the, the very last thing on the, the, the last question for the first assignment. Uh, I think uh, you did have to group, do a little bit of grouping. Let me check that here in a second. So back to the assignment, uh, ask you to do some stuff with, um, you know, doing some exploration sorts of things. So print out the first five elements. Um, um, I thought I asked you to do some more, but but then uh, do some things like create a new column, um, uh, create, uh, figure out the total uh, of some things. So, um, yeah, you, you probably don't have to use grouping for this. Uh, you can use um, some kind of a sorting if you want to uh, try and get the, the last little bit of extra credit here to replot, but um, um, uh, show the things sorted by their total. So, so. But just real quickly on, on these, so um, uh, we might... Uh, need to use a little bit of grouping for some of our assignments. Um, so a real simple one, it, it, you know, I might want to know what the, uh, the, the mean uh, was for the Shannon diversity, but for each of the different conditions, right? So remember for, uh, for 0.5 virulence, we replicated 50 times. So by grouping by virulence, uh, and then asking the mean of that, this is only the mean of those uh, values that had a virulence of 0.5. That's the mean of those 50. So, I mean, this is usual, This is probably what this experiment is trying to do, is seeing how diversity is affected by the virulence 
for this experiment here. So differences in this uh, mean here on the diversity uh, might mean something in this experiment, right? since we were replicating the virulence uh, multiple times. You could do mean, you could do standard deviation. Most any of those um, uh, functions that you can do on a whole column, you can do on a group when you group stuff like this. So this is, you know, uh, standard deviation or variance is useful to get an idea of, you know, is every is all 50 of the replications about the same mean or, or I'm getting a large um, spread of stuff. So in this case, most of the standard deviations were 0.4 to 0.7. But, um, Okay, you can read the rest of these. Uh, oh, there was a little bit about categorical attributes down here at the end. Uh, yeah, let me just do this, say a little bit more about these. Um, so these are in, important. Um, so there, there's kind of, what, most of the time, we're either going to be working with numeric data, so we'll have real value numbers, words and stuff, or um, um, sometimes we'll have integer values, and we want to keep them as integers. Um, so um, whole numbers, uh, but a lot of our data um, uh, feature um, is really pretty categorical. So um, you might have a feature which is the you know, cancer state, is what I usually use in examples. So we might have cancer state one, two, three, or four. The difference between that and that you can represent categorical as an integer by assigning uh, like an integer to that. It could be like a string. Um, one, two, so on. But the difference for a categorical variable is um, it's a finite set. And it's important to treat categorical variables different than uh, an integer, where the idea is that it can be any whole number from negative infinity to infinity, but a whole number. Right? So, uh, so we had an example of that as a, like, a letter grade for a class is categorical. There's only uh, letter grades A, B, C, D, or F. I don't know why I had E. <laughs> um, I guess I guess we change that later on. So um, so in this case, um, again, strings usually get defaulted down to that def that object if it doesn't really know how to get into a more specific data type like a, a float or a, or an int or something. Um, so, um, so anything that's categorical, we really do want to convert into a category data type uh, in order to correctly use it uh, in machine learning and in other contexts, right? So there's an easy way to do that. Just uh, if something is categorical, uh, the default is uh, it will assign basically uh, an integer to each one of those starting at zero. So we've got six, um, uh, we've actually got three categories, uh, A, B, and E, right? Uh, and behind the scenes, you can't really see it, but it will actually assign like zero, one, two uh, to the, the three categories that it did. But if, if we're using the, the data type as categorical, um, um, like this, these are the only valid uh, values 